Hello listeners, Kathy Lawless, Life Story Curator. I'm all about capturing and curating career and life stories as a meaningful way to celebrate a milestone moment like a big old birthday, anniversary, retirement, or graduation. And I'm at my best when curating photo books that move your memories from the basement or your phone or your computer to the coffee table, giving you and your family and friends access to these treasured memories for years to come. I also love curating and capturing life and career stories through this podcast series, How Did I Get Here? It's a series of interviews designed for people just starting out in their careers, people in transition or possibly feeling stuck, and giving them access to the stories of people who have been there, done that, so that they might be inspired with some new ideas or maybe just comforted knowing they're not alone, that everybody starts somewhere and everybody goes through times of transition and times when they feel stuck. Today, I am very excited to be interviewing Nicole Zimmerman, who is the founder and CEO of Zellosin and Partners. Welcome, Nicole. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Uh, Nicole and I met through the Wise Women group. And while we didn't get a lot of time to get to know each other, this is what I love about doing this podcast is that I get to know you through this interview, but then also uh, the other wise women will get to know a lot about you too as a new member to our group. We're going to pause for a moment to hear from a very happy Life Story Curator client. My name is Eleanor Allen and I recently finished a project with Kathy about my mother's life story. And the reason I wanted to do her life story was that she's first 91 years old And second, we've been talking about it for years as a family. I have four brothers and many nieces and nephews, and we had never gotten around to making the book. Then one day I was out with another friend who is a mutual friend of of mine and Kathy's, and she showed me the book that Kathy had made about her parents' 50th wedding anniversary. And I thought right then and there, this is the answer. I got to hire Kathy to get this life story finally done for my mother. So I did, and working with Kathy is just a joy and a pleasure. So first, how do you organize somebody's 90 plus years into a story that's succinct, but also very interesting? And Kathy helped guide myself and my niece and one of my brothers, I have four brothers, one of them worked on this project with us intensely into the the, uh, storyboarding process and then working into, okay, these are the chapters of her life we're going to work on, which we went by decade. And then for each decade of her life, what do we need? We need this many pictures and this many um, vignettes. And then Kathy also brought in this great idea to put in QR codes of recordings. I hadn't even thought of that, but we did several of those. Some are my mother's um, audio recordings. We captured some of those audio files. Some are video recordings of her telling stories of her life that we have in the book, but of course, much more detail when we have the recording. And some QR codes are also documents. So we put a link to my father's autobiography that he had written for us before he passed as well. And my grandfather's autobiography that my father had done uh, interviewing my grandfather. So very special and those come to life as well in the book. So I encourage you, if you have any inclination of documenting someone's life story in your life, definitely go for it. It's worth the work and the the product, in this case, my mother's story is absolutely wonderful. And she was over the moon with joy. So don't wait, do it. Document the life of your loved ones or whatever special occasion there is and work with Kathy and you will have a wonderful experience. So, Anyway, Nicole, before we get into what it means to be the founder and CEO of Zellosin and Partners, uh, I always like to start with the icebreakers. So if you would tell us uh, what part of the the uh, country or the world you grew up in and what your family dynamic was like in terms of birth order and how you think both of those, the geography and family dynamic kind of shaped you as a person. Yeah, i um, happy to share that with uh, your audience. Um, So I grew up in Germany, and I'm the oldest of two. I have a younger brother who is 10 years younger. And I feel that um, growing up in Germany definitely 
um, you know, bring some specific character traits. So I think around the world, Germans are known for being very open and honest and direct, um, which is an interesting uh, in trait to manage when you come to the Americas and work in corporate America. Um, and it uh, definitely led to me, um, you know, feeling responsible as the older sister, um, the firstborn and, and having a young brother. And, um, you know, uh, as our age difference was quite significant, um, being his babysitter for quite a while, you know, I think it was about learning how to be reliable, but also how to be responsible. And um, so I hope uh, my brother has good memories about me being his babysitter. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, I think, um, you know, I enjoyed growing up in Germany, but also as we will get through um, our interview here, probably to those points, but I also enjoy living abroad. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you ask, so you were almost an only child yeah 10 years right it was just you and your parents and then all of a sudden brother comes along and then now now like yeah. you said now you have to be yeah. babysitter and uh yeah and, and there was a dog in the mix so it was me a dog added to the family and then my brother so yes we were we were then uh three yeah. <laughs> so to say yes at, at what age then did you move to the uh the u.s so I actually first moved uh, within Europe. So I, uh, after my uh, my graduating from uh, from college, I actually had my first uh, couple of years of uh, work experience in Germany, and then I moved with a work opportunity to Austria. And then I spent quite some time in England. And then I moved also to Croatia before moving back to Austria and then from Austria to the US. So quite an interesting, uh, you know, geographical uh, um, uh, travel and moving uh, in Europe. Um, so 2011, I ended then up actually moving to the United States. To the US. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So then you pretty much you went through um, your young, young youth up into adult in Germany and, yes. uh, and then started the, the moves after that. So what, did, yeah. as a young person, then what, what did you do for fun? Were you music, sports, sports? So our, our family is all about sports. So, um, my, uh, my grandfather was a professional soccer player back in Germany, um, who played for, a club called Hanover 96 and he was actually a German national team player as well before the second world war my parents was a semi-professional uh, field and track athlete so we we have sports in our genes and so yeah it was all about sports tennis track and field um swimming you know it, it it was actually you know over the years different sports um that uh we um that we explored I never ended up playing soccer but my brother ended up playing soccer um and I love horseback riding so my, one of my big passions is really horseback riding so um and I love skiing so that's how it's like perfectly magical that I ended up in Colorado of all places in the United States with the best powder snow and so yeah yeah so very active family so then when little brother came he's qu not quite ready to do all of those fun things so you're you probably needed a few years before he became more fun <laughs> yeah you know i i think um you know um in our early teens and 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 teenage years you know the age difference really made a difference in terms of living separate lives so to say mm -hmm. but uh, after I left home um, to go to college and and he in his teenage years I think we we bonded much more so the older he got you know um, I feel like um, we bonded much more and now um, you know we are great friends and 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 confidants and uh, um, you know um, supporting each other very much and um, the age difference is you know not mattering any longer as much as it does when you're a kid yeah when you're 18 and he's 10 right? exactly exactly <laughs> or uh, the way around he's eight you're 18 and he's yeah yeah and he's yeah. eight exactly he's eight. yeah anyway <laughs> I can do math I really can so so uh, how many languages do you speak then 
Um, so uh, German and English, and then a tiny little bit of French. Okay. Enough to order my my delicious uh, French coffee and my delicious baguette and cheese <laughs> in <Yeah>. French. <laughs> But yeah, so English and German are my main languages I speak. Okay. And I take this, your brother and your parents, do they still live in Germany? Yeah, they are all back in Germany. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to shift gears a little bit here uh, on, mm -hmm. on meter on yes. a scale of one to five, one being a couch potato and five being the life of the party. Where do you <laughs> I think I'm a solid 3.5. <laughs> 3 okay. Right in the right in the middle somewhere. You know, I, I like uh, you know relaxation and hanging out, but I also love to party. So, you know, it really depends on the mood I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So would you say you're more of an introvert or an extrovert or maybe that ambivert if you're a 3.5? Um, yeah, so I'm right as I would say at the, at the, at the, uh, cusp of from an introvert to an extrovert. I like, uh, like being out, um, in public. I like speaking. I like teaching. But for my social relationships, I, I am not so much an extrovert. I, I rather have my set relationships and love them dearly. Um, but uh, learn that networking can be very powerful and something that is actually necessary in your career. So, you know, I manage towards um, a, a good place between, um, you know, maybe naturally tending more towards an introvert, but using being an extrovert when I need it um, and when it's beneficial or valuable for me. Um, so I, I think I, I manage between the two, I would say. Yeah. I think I'm definitely the same as well. I'm in, in that middle zone and yeah. there's times I get great energy from being alone and there's times I get great energy from people. And uh, exactly, exactly. And, uh, so I can, I can get for both, but if I start going one or the other too heavy, I do find I got to, you know, yeah. kind of bring you. myself back to the other one. So, yeah. okay. On the risk meter on a mm -hmm. scale of one to five, one being low risk taker, five being high risk taker. How do you see yourself? Um, I would uh, describe myself as a as a cautiously and careful risk taker. So I'm very analytical. So I need um, good insights, good data, good facts um, to take risk. And I don't know if that is really something that risk real true risk takers are doing that they are evaluating the situations before they jump into it. So. I would I would say I'm probably more towards a two be between a two and three on your meter uh, than in the middle of it. So I I need to know certain th parameters uh, and the environment before I'm um, willing to take a risk. Okay, well I love these uh, intro questions just because they give us some good insight into who you are yeah. as as you go through your story. Now we get it all starts to to fall into place. So, yeah. so let's jump in then. And why don't you tell us a, a little bit about what it means to be the founder and CEO of Zello, Zellosin and Partners, and then we'll get into how did I get here? Yeah. Excellent timing, actually, to ask me that question, Kathy, because uh, I'm just about six months into my journey of being an entrepreneur and having founded my company. So I left corporate um, two years ago now um, and uh, took quite a break to just rejuvenate and reset myself um, and um, felt like I wanted to really spread my knowledge and my skills and my talents across more people, uh, companies or individuals. And so Founding my company meant for me to actually be more self-determined in terms of my journey. Um, I call it my second career, just age-wise and where I am after 25 years in corporate. Um, I 
deliberately designed it as a portfolio career of things that I want to offer to people and to companies. So one is definitely at the core is the consulting, strategic marketing, digital transformation. But I have a huge passion for coaching and mentoring, which I have done my entire life. And so I decided to make that actually a real um, part of my services that I offer um, as uh, executive leadership coaching, specifically from a cultural change management and diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective. And then I'm teach and I speak, as I alluded earlier uh, uh, about, and I am um, ready to be appointed to board. So I'm I'm seeking board positions. And so in the combination of those things, I'm, I'm forming what uh, I call my portfolio career, my portfolio second career. And I enjoy it very much. And so I wake up every morning and am excited of what the day brings. And, you know, there are so many, such a variety of things that I'm doing that I feel it's so much more fulfilling and rewarding. And so it's a very exciting journey to be on. And uh, I'm proud um, that I was able um, to really found my own business and now um, be on the journey of growing my business. Yeah, very exciting. So taking all of those years of experience and expertise and relationship building right and then how do you then instead of being in one organization to perform all those things right it's how can you then share that with other organizations so exactly well, wonderful. well congratulations i know it's a big step Thank uh you. you know i made that step too from corporate into the entrepreneurial uh tough step to make sometimes and it's a, it can be very lonely because <laughs> in corporate many times your your schedule your life is not your own it's controlled by so many other people and yeah. so many other demands so well very cool well let's talk now about how did i get here you know when you were you know young person in Germany, back junior high, high school, or I don't mm -hmm. know what they called it then, middle school, or yeah. uh, what uh, What did you want to be when you grew up? Did you always think, since you went corporate, you wanted to be corporate, or did you always think there was that entrepreneurial opportunity, or what, what were your dreams? No, actually, it was something completely different. I actually wanted to become an archaeologist, so Ooh. I love I loved actually... Um, you know, uh, Agatha Christie's crime novels and her life uh, of exploring and finding the ingredients for her crime novels while exploring countries and, you know, um, definitely spending quite some time with her husband, who was an archaeologist uh, abroad. And while I'm not a writer, uh, I found just the idea of discovering things very enticing. And uh, um, as I'm a very curious person, I, I want to get to the bottom of things. And so I felt that that was something. Um, but uh, my father... <laughs> was very kind in a very nice fatherly way said well um yeah maybe that's something very interesting and you might you know become a hobby archaeologist but for a, a, a breadwinning profession I'm not so sure and so he gently nudged me towards maybe you want to learn something more solid as we would call it in Germany you know and uh, then you have it in your pocket and then you can decide what you want to do and so I actually after high school so gymnasium as it is called in in Germany um I did an apprenticeship. So you probably know that Germany is, um, you know, very much uh, a dual education system. So you can do an apprenticeship and learn a craft and become a master in a craft, or you can go um, the higher education route and go to college and, you know, learn a profession that way. And so, and sometimes you combine those two journeys, you know, you first do an apprenticeship. So I did actually an apprenticeship in tax uh, consulting, advising, and accounting. And then when I went to university, I said, I keep my track open to become potentially a CPA because I love numbers and I'm very analytical, but I want to do something else as well. And my curiosity about getting to the bottom of things, I was like, 
I like marketing. I like the communication and engaging and interacting with customers. So maybe I combine those two. So back in the days, that was a very interesting combination. Even today, people are like, what, you're an accountant and a marketeer? How does that even fit together? <laughs> but um, my love for numbers, you know, were bringing me on that accounting um rail and um, then I became a marketeer um, and decided to stay on the marketing side but back in the days was probably um, one of not many marketeers who were really good with numbers and so I think that was also something that allowed me um, to build the career I have built and uh, I was able to live so um, yeah an, an interesting combination of <laughs> how I started. Yeah. Well, I love that. You have the dream of what you want to do, but then the practical side, your father's like, well, maybe that's not going to be uh, the, quite the breadwinning career that you would like it to be. So yeah. little, some words of wisdom and that you, uh, you heeded his advice. You know, sometimes as a young person, we don't um, want to pay attention to those things that maybe are, um, you know, counter to what we want to do, <laughs> even yeah. though it's probably the smart thing to do. So you did the smart thing. I I did. And I, I did not regret it one, one single bit. I was able through my career to travel to places and explore places and, and uh, really feed my curiosity in different ways. So it, it worked out really well. Yeah. So how did you get that first job then? And was the first job then well, you said apprenticeship, so it started more on the financial side, and then you got that first marketing job, or give us a sense. Yeah, of exactly. So the apprenticeship is a, a two and a half year um, uh, uh, commitment um, to be a certified tax accountant uh, apprentice. And so after that, I went to college, studied accounting and marketing, and then decided I want to pursue the marketing uh more than the accounting and so my first job was actually at the consulting company of my father because he had his own consulting business at the time for one of his biggest clients which is uh was uh Deutsche Telekom uh, T-Mobile back in the days and so that was my first interaction and I was um uh, really working on different projects, product, sales, marketing, got to know a lot about, you know, telecommunication business back in the days, you know, it was the, the days of uh, really the mobile operators, like spreading like mushrooms across the world, you know, and the fixed line business was suffering really big time. The first mobile phones were out there 25 years ago, you know, mm -hmm. you think back, it's like amazing. And so, so, um, yeah, but that was a period of two years. And then through that project that I worked on for Deutsche Telekom, I uh, was part of a diligence team that looked into um, for Deutsche Telekom to buy a, a private mobile operator in Austria, uh, which they did. And it became T-Mobile Austria. And um, so I actually went for the diligence project to Vienna and then uh, got an offer actually from the project manager back in the days to actually stay on and uh, start my career in a corporate organization. Oh, wow. Yeah. So these um, different experiences just kind of lead you to new opportunities. Yes. So I, I love that you talked about, um, and I think it's so interesting, this track in Germany where you talk about there's this apprentices apprentice track, but then there's the college track, you know, in, in the US, it seems like so many, so often it's just the college track. And then you go down the college track, you start that first job only to find out maybe that's not where you want to be. Yes. So it's great that you yes. actually started working in a field first, mm -hmm. which then also gave you some insight that maybe I want to do something a little bit different. So Wow. Yeah, I was not up for the I was not up for the April 15th deadline every year and doing every year the same, you know, uh tax returns. And so I was like, no, that that's while I love numbers, I felt like that might be a little bit boring day to day. And so I found marketing much more 
you know, exciting, you know, designing, you know, programs for customers, for loyalty, for engagement. And so my focus area became back in the days, customer relationship management. So how are you actually managing relationships with customers and how are you making them profitable and how are you keeping them profitable? So yeah, it, it, it was a great way of finding my way to my professional passion. Yeah. Yeah. And using both sides of your brain. Well, you started down that heavy analytical side, then recognize relationships, creativity, mm -hmm. maybe bring in both of them. So yeah, very cool. Okay. So then you're in, is it, was it uh, Vienna then that you said you got yes. offered to stay on in corporate? So take yes. us from there. Yeah. So, um, so I had, and, and by the way, that's kind of a high risk taking a, you know, adventure, I think, but anyway, I guess it's calculated because <laughs> you already had been working with them on a project. Right. So <laughs> exactly. So, so, and it happened to uh, actually also coincide with my love life uh, as my uh, partner back in the days was from Vienna. And so it was oh, like okay. a, a perfect setup for me um, that, uh, that really was a, a lucky coincidence and uh, worked well. Um, so yeah, so then I did a couple of years at T-Mobile and then, um, the team that I was part of and responsible for customer relationship management for the, uh, business to business customers, um, was actually asked to become the center of excellence for T-Mobile International. So the entire European organization of T-Mobile out of Austria, managing really the B2B segment, and working with the different countries where T-Mobile has subsidiaries in. And um, we did that for a couple of years and it was super interesting because right there and then, you know, I mean, going from Germany to Austria is not as risky. It's the same language, you know, it's mm, to a certain extent, okay. the same culture. There are quite some significant differences, but a lot of things are also similar. So, you know, it felt still not like a dramatic step somehow that was risky or anything. Um, but then I learned to get to know more cultures across Europe, you know, Dutch, uh, you know, Czech Republic, Croatia, uh, British, you know, I mean, it was, it was an interesting dynamic. And so then I spent a lot of time in the UK as well between UK. So London and Vienna and, um, then one day someone said, well, we don't need these center of excellences any longer. And um, T-Mobile Austria as an organization that hosted us said, well, but we need this, we don't need this team either. So that was my first moment and experience where an entire group was laid off. And so I was like, in shock. I was like, oh my God, what did I do wrong? Did I not perform uh, in the best way possible so that, you know, our organization in, in, in Vienna doesn't think that we are valuable to them, you know, but how corporate decisions are made. Um, and so, you know, it took two weeks and then I got a phone call from the CMO of T-Mobile Croatia. And he was uh, from the Netherlands and he was just appointed to be the CMO down there. And so he said, you know, I heard what happened in Vienna. I have a great opportunity for you. Why are you not coming, joining me in Zagreb in Croatia uh, and taking on the B2B segment here? And I'm like, wow, I that sounds like a great opportunity. And I think coming back to your question, um, you know, of am I a risk taker or not? At that moment, I felt like I'm taking a huge risk, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, I felt it's still a, a comfortable environment. I know telecommunication. I know T-Mobile as a company. I have worked with some of the colleagues in Croatia when I was working for T-Mobile International. So I felt like it's like, uh, as I said, it's like, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's like a careful, you know, assessed risk. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so then I ended up in Croatia and um, enjoyed that time, learned a lot about, you know, cultural differences as my team was consisting out of 
a lot of people from different backgrounds of ex-Yugoslavia, which, as you might remember, have been at war 10 years before um, in, a, in a really a dramatic, um, you know, regional conflict. And so it was a lot of conflict management for me uh, between the Serbs in my team and the people from Bosnia Herzegovina and the people from Croatia. And so at that time, my leader, I think my leadership style formed quite a bit because I had to learn how to um, get a team, stay focused on the task at hand and the goals at hand, but at the end also solving interpersonal conflicts because just of the history that the country had gone through and where people were coming from in terms of their heritage. So um, wow. enjoyed that. Can yeah. I just, I'm going to interrupt you for a second there. You know, yeah. leadership, you know, there's always conflict management and leadership when you, you know, you look at it, but typically it's about maybe just a personality type, yeah. or it could be about the difference between sales and operations. And sometimes mm -hmm. there's tension there, but this goes way, way deeper. This yeah. is really embedded historical, traditional yes. upbringings. You know, this is, you know, almost yes. like religious conflict as well. I mean, that, so mm -hmm. that has got to be really yeah. you know, a, a huge dynamic that you're thinking, wait a minute, we're all here to work, right? Not. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it was, um, it was uh, a, a great learning. And I feel, you know, we were, and, and maybe I think being German helped a lot, because, you know, with the, with the history of, of what Germany is responsible for, you know, in the world, in terms of World War One and World War Two, we, we grew up with, you know, guilt and responsibility of making sure this is not happening again you know this is what we learned over and over again make sure this is not happening again look out for those signs that you know are out there when you know political dynamics are happening and so in a team setup in a corporation um how that unfolded was you know you have Catholics, you have Christians, you have Muslims, and you have that that geographical conflict for ex Yugoslavia. And so it was it was because I had that sensitivity, I feel, and I have the honesty and directness. I was just telling people what I was seeing and what I was witnessing. And I think that helped um, because they were at least good with taking feedback and listening and then adjusting and said, yes, we know, you know, this conflict is 10 years old and I chose to live in Croatia, not in Serbia. So maybe I also need to look at how I as a Serb live in Croatia or how I as a Bosnia live in Croatia. So, so it, it was, yeah, it was a very interesting dynamic. Wow. Wow. Did you, did you bring any external uh, consultants in or team building? You know, a lot of times, you know, there's the whole, how do we, how do we build a team? How do we do yeah. some team building events? But you almost had to like get people to neutral before yeah. they could even go to the next level. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, wow. yeah. so we had definitely good support from, from the HR organization. Mm -hmm. We didn't have specifically coaching, but because the leadership team was multicultural as well. So as I said, my CMO came from the Netherlands. A couple of other people came from other countries in Europe. So I felt like we were role modeling for them of how in a multicultural setup, you should just go about your business together, you know? So I think they could see of how we as an executive leadership team were operating, that it's okay to have had differences, you know, the French and the Germans have a love-hate relationship, you know, the Dutch and the Germans, especially when it comes to soccer, have a hate-love <laughs> relationship, you know, so, so we were just role modeling, I feel, for them, how in a multicultural environment, you, you know, operate, you know, and, and what you are, how you need to manage yourself to not take things personal, but also understand you're in a professional environment. And that is different than your personal opinions and your personal beliefs, even if you sometimes can't separate them, but you can manage them, you can be aware of them, and you can manage them. So I felt like we were good examples for them of how to work with each other. 
Yeah. I like that. You, you can't separate them, but maybe, but you can manage them, you know, kind of the difference of who I'm being and then what yeah. my behavior is, who I am and what my behavior is. Yeah. Wow. So now when I look at, you know, listen back to your introduction about what all you bring as a consultant. And when you talked about diversity and inclusion, you have a very different perspective on that because of what you, what you lived through, where you were born mm -hmm. and how this multicultural. Yeah. 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 And then, so fast forward after that experience, I was after 12 years in the telecommunication business, just tired of the industry. So I felt there must be something else out there. And so um, through a recruiter, I had the opportunity to actually move into financial services, um, went uh, to take on a, a, a leadership role at Western Union to lead their European marketing team. And as Western Union is a truly, truly global company, I think one of the most global brands in the world, for sure. Um, I had then the opportunity after four years in that role in Vienna, managing Europe out of Vienna. So Western Union's headquarter back in the days was in Vienna, the Europe one. And so then I had the opportunity uh, because our European, Middle East, Africa, Asia um, uh, um, manager was appointed actually the new CEO of Western Union globally. So he moved to the United States, to Denver, where the headquarter of Western Union is. And I had uh, the opportunity a half a year later for a really great uh, global marketing role to follow. And so I went uh, and took that opportunity and said, this is um, the best that can happen when you are in an international marketing uh, role um, to go to work for a Fortune 500 US company in their headquarter with global responsibilities. So that's how I ended then up in 2011 in Denver. And um, yeah, enjoyed my years at Western Union um, in marketing and then had the opportunity actually to get into the transformation office of Western Union, which was, as the company has um, such a long heritage, 170 years now, I think, back in the days, 160 years. Um, how is such a company actually, you know, set up to fight off all the fintechs and all the digitization of financial services and cross-border remittance and payments and stuff like that. And so that was super interesting to leave marketing and actually go into the transformation side of the business and learn everything of what happens in the business, you know, from, um, you know, the revenue driving elements to um, the cost driving elements, thinking of a balance sheet, back to my tax accounting, thinking of a balance sheet, <laughs> you know, the income side and the, and the, and the, and the cost side and uh, learning a lot about how companies are operating and, and functioning. And so that was a, a wonderful moment of bringing back more even my accounting background and, you know, looking into how to manage valuable customer relationships and, and, and how to make that a, a, a true uh, program in terms of loyalty and things like that. So it was, it was a wonderful time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just see how all your experience keeps building on, uh, on itself and in terms of you know going from you know the marketing then into the transformation office and yes. that's the strategy as well as in all the leadership that you had and yeah. well it's very funny because our paths probably overlapped at western union a bit i was consulting there in 2012 and 13 oh really and uh, somewhat of the transformation office uh it was more on the i was on the procurement side um and we were yes looking at, uh, some of the yeah. cost reduction and stuff so anyway i'm uh, anyway interesting oh, yeah we might have passed yeah the the transformation office was 2013 exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. and I think what we were we weren't called transformation office at the time I think we were yeah. called um global service delivery or something like that uh huh yeah there was something else that we were yeah because mm -hmm. it was really looking at all the, the locations around the world how many yeah. locations did there need to be um, yeah. what were the cost savings and how that they're moving yes. more into digital and what did that look like for the, yes. the, the regions? And then, you know, there's all the different, uh, org structures. So yeah, it was yeah. fascinating. And, you know, I yes. was part of first data part before, and then, you know, uh -huh. stepping over to, to Western union when, yeah. 
Yeah, very, very interesting. We'll have to do more coffees to compare notes. Yes, uh, we do. <laughs> okay, so so then you, how long were you at Western Union then? Yeah, yeah so, so then, yeah, so then the transformation office moved into um, what was called the Wu Wei, which was really mm -hmm. um, taking the transformation efforts out of a department's responsibility and actually laying it out more like the change of the way of how the organization works, which is transformational from the bottom. And so there were 10 people assigned to work with uh, McKinsey as a consultancy, consultancy company um, to really bring lean and agile methodology into the organization and work on strategic growth opportunities, but continue to work on the uh, cost optimization as well. So I was part of those 10 selected and did that for two years, a year and a half, actually. Our assignment was two years, but it actually was for me a year and a half because then I was second to actually support the new president of the B2B division and take on his marketing team and reset the entire brand positioning and um, marketing team for the B2B division called Western Union Business Solutions. So became their chief marketing officer, if you want to say. So now I'll step back to, I shouldn't say back. Marketing, but... yeah. Back into marketing, yes. very cool. Yes, yes, yes. And in a different capacity because now you are really in a chief marketing officer role, which means you have really all of the responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. from team building over decision-making for suppliers, vendors, mark tech stack, um, you know, uh, corporate uh, communications, PR, any type of acquisition, development, retention, uh, sales enablement, sales support, lead generation. So it was now the entire suite of marketing responsibilities. And that is what I loved about it because um, now coming with all my international experience from marketing, all my transformation experience and lean and agile, and now setting up a new marketing team there were people around the world that were marketeers but it was not a true marketing team as such so building that and laying the foundation and creating this entire marketing organization was I think one of the most rewarding jobs I ever had wow yeah tapping into all of your background and yes because you know there's the whole you got to know the number side, the business, the strategy, but then how do you take it to market? How do you sell exactly. it? And, uh, exactly. And are you successful yeah. in that? And <laughs> Yes, we were. Results, we were very yeah. successful. Yes. Yes. Very cool. So yeah. And then there was an opportunity two years ago where um, the organization was restructuring. And um, so I was um, offered to go back into the transformation office um, was asked to become um, the chief deputy transformation officer or um, to take a severance package. So, and, you know, always when you get to these junctures oh, in yes, life, yes, yes, yes. It, is, it is fascinating. And um, back in those days, that was, we were six months into COVID and the global pandemic. And I was actually at home with my parents in Germany because we had a family situation. And um, so I was there when I had to make such a significant life decision. I was back in my childhood home with my parents around me. And I was like, oh my God, this is the best way of being comforted through making this decision because your parents know you the best. Your parents love you unconditionally. Doesn't matter what decision you take. So I felt like so supported in, in, my, um, in my decision of looking really, am I ready to leave corporate? And if I leave corporate, what does that mean? You know, and Again, my father, who was always there my entire career as a great advisor and consultant and gently nudging me, you know, uh, and supporting me and sometimes being critical about some things as well, was just reminding me um, 
that I had, you know, played with the idea of leaving corporate and doing something different, um, more meaningful, more rewarding um, than just working for one corporation. And so he just reminded me and I said, this is just what I needed. So I slept one night over it. And then the next morning I was having, the decision was there and I was like, yeah, I am ready to move on. Whatever that means. That was, I think the most riskiest step I ever made because, you know, I'm single. I have no kids to take care of, but I also don't have a husband. And so I have to take care of my, my own financial security and my own financial well-being and so that was a quite risky step but I felt like I got this and I can do it and so I went on that journey of uh, taking a break and then founding Zalozin and Partners. Yeah wow wow thank you for sharing that it's very interesting and um, you know you have to include always I think the timing of when these things happen and what was going on in the world the fact that we were in covid big driver yes. of a lot of business decisions, right? That yes. then turned into very personal decisions for employees. Yes. Um, yes. So I'm guessing that this one felt different than that first one at T-Mobile where you were the center of excellence. You know, you're thinking they got on top of the world and then bang, they just eliminated the whole department. This yes. was probably a lot different. I do know at Western Union, through my experience there, you know, restructuring happens all the time. All the time. Yes. <laughs> and you yes. think you're I mean you're in the dream job, you're you're yep. killing it, everything's working great, but no, we got to take this and change it over here. Yeah, next thing you know yep. you're like, "Wait a minute. We yeah. we barely got that implemented, right?" Yes. Yes. And you know, it was also a situation where that uh current leadership that I was facing, um my direct manager, I just didn't have a good relationship with him, so he um, it was not the president that I came into uh, earlier. So he actually moved on to an, a new role at Western Union. And so the CFO became the president of the organization and we just didn't have it. And so it was actually a good timing um, for me because I was miserable, to be honest, the last couple of months of uh, feeling not appreciated, not feeling valued, felt like the work of the team is not valued. It's not even understood very well of how marketing in, impacts. And because I'm very analytical, I presented all the numbers because he is obviously someone with a financial background. He's a CFO. Um, and that didn't count anything. It was always questioned and doubted uh, if the numbers are right, if the KPIs are right. And I was like, oh my God, I'm doing this for 20 years. I can't believe, you know, that that someone is not taking the number in front of him and understand <laughs> understanding that. But anyway, so it was a, it was the right moment and I didn't feel like going back into the transformation office. I had done that for six years at Western Union and I felt this is not... This would have not been a move that would have brought me forward, that would have taken me maybe sideways or even backwards. And I felt like mm -hmm. this, this, this is this is not an option. And then to be very honest, back to my love for numbers, I just calculated how long would I need to work in that new job versus taking my severance package net net was 18 ah. months. And I was like, I'm not giving anyone 18 months of my precious life <laughs> and or can have it right here in my hand. And so that was actually made that financial risk assessment for me, something that was where I'm like, in 18 months, I can build something that can take me financially into a place where I'm good. And that's exactly what happened. And I believed uh, that I can do it. And trusted my my gut there and um so far I need to knock on wood but I'm I'm I couldn't imagine being in a better place than I am right now yeah yeah well and I'm guessing also the the whole COVID environment also got all of us to look at what's really important in life um yes. and that giving time to others or the time it takes to to uh to provide to other yeah you, you started to use really start protecting your time right I think oh absolutely that became the most valuable thing yeah. you know and I'm I really 
enjoyed working with my team and I had a world-class marketing team that we built really over those two years. And um, that was all wonderful, but I myself didn't feel good any longer. And then I was like, how can I be a good leader to my team? Mm -hmm. If yeah. I'm not true to my values, to my beliefs, I need to stay true to myself. And that was the time where I felt this is, this is the time to move on. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Cause you know, it's, you, you know, you see all these changes and transitions that people have, but really you need to understand, well, what was going on in your brain? Right. Cause that's the hard part in these decisions yeah. and how did you feel when it happened? And yeah. So anyway, I appreciate you being open and honest. Like you said that that's who you are. So yes, exactly. We, we do need to start uh, wrapping up though. I can yeah. keep chatting with you all afternoon. We'll have to schedule more time to compare notes. Yes. So uh, anyway, um, I have two wrap up questions. The first is um, tell us what you think served you best when you look back on your career and your life. Is it a characteristic, a strength, a habit? Mm -hmm. What served you best? So one thing is definitely my curiosity for new things, you know, so this exploring. So back to my early dream of becoming an <laughs> archaeologist, I, I just love to solve complex problems and I love to change things to become better. I love to help and advise people. Uh, uh, you know, mentoring is a, is a big part of my leadership style and, and how I lived my entire career. Um, I think resilience is another thing that really um, uh, helped me. Um, I, I, I have, you know, a, a good, uh, I would say, set of uh characteristics around being you know a woman being you know uh, from Germany being a Capricorn I, I believe in my zodiac sign characteristics you know um, so you know Capricorns are known for being solid with their hoofs on the ground but they climb mountains and they climb high and so you know this resilience of keeping going um, is something that for sure, um, you know, is something that helped me always. Um, and so I would say those two um, and, and my gift of being just structured and process oriented and can see things through from end to end, where some people might only see a part of it and, and I can really envision things end to end. I think these are the things that definitely helped me in my career, but also in my personal life and brought me to many places to get to know and cultures and people and countries. Yeah, I love that. You got to be Agatha Christie after all, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I start writing at one point, I don't know. You're traveling around the world, yeah, you just didn't do the writing. Exactly, part, so. exactly. <laughs> So last question then, um, any words of wisdom that really impacted you at a point maybe when you were down or making a tough decision? Mm. So one thing was um, really, you know, for, for many people that might mean something different, but I always remind myself of carpe diem to use the day and to use the moment to really be in it, be present and and try to use any opportunity, even if the circumstances are negative. And out of that developed something that I used for myself. And now that I'm on this journey, share with a lot of people that leave corporate and trying to figure out what to do next. And that's embrace and enjoy this journey. It's not an easy journey. And it looks for everyone different because everyone's situation is different. But I feel that when you embrace it and you enjoy it, even in the negative moments, in the in the heavy moments, it it makes you grow so much and it helps you to feel like you can conquer the world. It 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 really supports your confidence building. And you just need to trust yourself. And so that embracing and enjoying the journey you are on is definitely something. 
And then last but not least, something that I just heard recently, and you might know that because I went with the wise women to the Colorado Women's Foundation luncheon a couple of weeks ago with uh, Anne and a couple of others. And uh, Alison Felix was speaking, the field and track superstar oh, in the yeah. mm -hmm. United I States. I was out of town. And she said something that I, that I found very powerful, and that was, use your own voice even when it shakes. And that stuck with me. And I was like, yeah, sometimes, you know, in these moments when it's hard, you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm whispering. I have no voice at all. No, you know, even if your voice is shaking, use it. And I found that very powerful. So I think that's the third thing that I would share with your audience. Wow. Well, I love that, that, that carpe diem, you know, when we were just chatting before we started the interview, you talked about the excitement for every day. And I yes. remember when I was on my journey, you know, figuring out my new business and what that looked like, you do get that, you know, that impatient that you want things to happen faster, mm -hmm. right? And so sometimes you forget mm -hmm. to enjoy the journey or forget to look at that day as an opportunity. What's going to happen yes. today, right? Mm -hmm. Versus the, yes. I don't have anything scheduled for today, or I did I do enough yesterday? And you know, you can, yeah. you're right about that, you that mm -hmm. heavy moment. So I really love that because yes. I know I could have used that encouragement. Yes. And, um, and now mm -hmm. when I look back on where I was at times, I wish I would have enjoyed those mm -hmm. times more, right? That whole, the, um, mm -hmm. you know, you do have to almost appreciate and love and welcome the uncertainty of, well, what is going to happen? Because you keep thinking, there's this notion mm -hmm. that, well, I can control it and I need to do X and Y, and then that leads mm -hmm. to Z and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you get, I don't know, mm -hmm. it can be too much. It can be too much sometimes. So instead of yes. relishing in the, yeah. well, what's going to happen today? So, and then that's positive yeah. energy in yeah. the universe, which attracts more positive energy. Anyway, I can go on and on. <laughs> so, exactly. That is a whole, that is a whole nother podcast. Yeah. <laughs> and one more thing we can talk about when we do our, our coffee together. So Absolutely. Well, Nicole, it has been such a pleasure to get to know you today through your interview. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank Enjoy. you for having me. Uh, listeners, if you enjoyed today's uh, interview, please subscribe below so you'll be alerted when other interviews are published. And if you have any questions for me or for Nicole, I'll post her social media contact information on my website. Uh, you can find this interview and more information on lifestorycurator.com. And on that note, I'll say stay safe, stay well, and let's keep sharing those stories. Have a great day. Thank you.